Hello everybody and welcome to the Voyage of Oceanus. Hopefully I pronounced that right. Anyways, um, so I'm actually on mine and Xena's Asia account because I totally forgot that this is like a whole story. And so when I went into it, I was recording it, but I didn't have my voice. And so <laughs> I recorded like 20 minutes of it and then I was like, oh shoot, you know what? I want my voice in it. So I'm on the Asia account and we're going to go right on in and look at that. Oh yeah, we got to gotta log in and then once this is all done, I'm going to move back to the other one. Chapter one. Oh snap, we can actually go onto the boat because this is a different time zone. Ooh. Chapter. Here we go. Prologue. Rumors upon the waves. It all began with a commission letter I received a fortnight ago. A client, a certain Mr. Worthington, is a survivor of the shipwreck that took place over 25 years ago, an incident that has been shrouded in rumors of the supernatural since its untimely occurrence. As the survivors of the incident continue to die or disappear under mysterious circumstances, Mr. Worthington has found himself caught in a mire of panic and hopes that the agency can uncover the truth behind this matter. Also, it's like 1 o'clock in the morning and it's really... It's, I'm laying in bed, so sorry if I sound tired. As a matter of, as a matter of course, I went to the local archives with Lady Truth to gather information regarding this incident. The Isambard Ocean Liner, a steel giant that perished at sea 25 years ago, her last voyage was primarily an ocean, oceano, oce, oceanographic research mission. I oceanographic I don't know how to pronounce that research mission but the end of which only a scant few passengers survived led by a renowned marine biologist professor Branley the surviving researchers drastically altered their public image by inserting that the incident was caused by a series of bizarre supernatural events it was 12 years ago that professor Branley went missing that it that his only daughter wrote a series of articles defending her father's claims saying that these seafarers legends are all irrefutable truths Ooh. dear mr inference i have been living in the shadows of this tragedy ever since the isambard succumbed to the waves 25 years ago perhaps you are already aware of the fact that i am the last remaining survivor of the shipwreck perhaps you have also heard that over the 25 years since the shipwreck all of the other survivors have died in suspicious circumstances or have mysteriously vanished without a trace i had been maintaining correspondence with a confidant who was on that cursed vessel but six months ago the news of his disappearance became the last straw that caused my spirit to finally sink now i find it almost impossible to rest to re rest my mind away from the notion that as the last one left, it is only a matter of time before the curse claims me. I firmly believe that all happenings are more than coincidence, thus I am sending you this commission, hoping that the truth can save me from my fate. Furthermore, the unsettling accounts of supernatural events that occurred on that ship back then are no means spurious. But as far as I can recall, the details are not entirely consistent with the version presented by Professor Branley. Enclosed with this letter are Professor Branley's statement and detailed voyage records from 25 years ago. Sincerely and gracio graciously yours, Richard Worthington. Our voyage was very calm until the third night when a storm swept up the entire ship. At that time, I was in a cabin organizing the research data I had obtained so far. That was when I noticed an unusual figure hovering outside the cabin door. I assumed it was merely a crew member on patrol, but moments later I stopped dead and stunned with fear. There was never a sound of footsteps, and the passageway went 
passageway went completely silent. In the days that followed, several of my colleagues also witnessed this same phantom. An airy shroud of fear enveloped the entire ship, giving birth to an oppressive atmosphere of panic, and the equipment on board began to encounter abnormalities. Abnormalities. I probably said that right the first time, but I think I also said it wrong. Oh, oh, who cares? <laughs> we lost our bearings in the storm and found ourselves trapped in an unknown dimension, isolated from the world, isolated from all civilization. The storm reduced visibility to naught, while the sea itself transformed into an ominous portal, em emitting a chilling and nauseating glow. Dark, rolling, ghastly figures escaped from its doors so dense that the sea trickled like lava, and the sky became an obscured mass. It was only when some of the shadows emitted hollow, deranging screams that we finally realized these sounds could only belong to the evil, wicked entities. I have, I had to question amidst such chaos and fear whether we had, in fact, left the realm of the living. We needed to remain vigilant about not only the unexplained phenomena surrounding us, but also the other unbalanced minds of the people with whom we were sailing, perverted by fear and despair. The dim light on the sea was like a lure or a mockery of any passenger who claimed to still have their wits about them. On the day before the sinking of the Insimbard, I stood on the deck with a few others. The ship was being pushed by a huge external force that was not born from the waves, and there again, I vaguely saw the shadow right beneath the surface. Note, in my memories, there was not a single instance of unexplained equipment found function occurrence on the ship, and until the ship sank, I felt no tremendous thrust that did not belong to the waves, as Professor Branley claimed. Interesting. Accompany the letter is also the client's collection of detailed voyage records. According to the client, Professor Branley seemed to have a habit of assigning codes to different passengers in his personal records, and these codes are mostly derived from various maritime legends. I have organized the passengers by their different codes and their features in the records to create a form. As Pedokelon had a burly physique and always gave the most correct instructions, the last and most solid defense line for the ship in the storm. As Pedokelon persisted in guarding the cabin and was sacrificed to the bottom of the sea along with a huge steel coffin. Sea Rhinoceros. Sea Rhinoceros was a seasoned voyager who had amassed numerous treasures from the sea into their collection. If not for the several changes happening on the ship, this would have been the most successful voyage yet for the sea rhinoceros. Sea Serpent. The guardian of scientific rules, the sea serpent, never gave up their principles, but unfortunately their scientific predictions were shattered by a storm shortly after setting sail. Their steadfast rationality ultimately being crushed by uncontainable terror. Siren. Pleasing to the eye and demonstrating a fondness for all manner of beautiful things, they were the core authority when it came to certain affairs aboard the ship until the terrifying storm arrived, and the passengers no longer had time to enjoy themselves. Kraken. A guide buried in the ocean, Kraken believed that there was something nobler than life, which the vast majority of the other passengers could not seem to detect. Prister? The ever-trustworthy Prister brought irreplaceable value to the ship through their work and wealth of experience. Sea Unicorn, particularly keen on recording all the details of the voyage and was very curious about the various affairs aboard the ship. The intelligent Sea Unicorn became the first sacrifice of the strange incident, though it was not consumed by fear instead losing their mind. Rockus. Rockus loved the most fleeting and elusive things in life. When the storm came, Rockus insisted on sailing straight into the storm just to get as close to the intangible entity pursuing them. Charybdis? Charybdis? 
with the habit of keeping a diary as well as possessing proficient pro, proficient proficient competencies the ignorant cherubis ultimately gave up the will to survive and leaped into the deep sea rife with twisted shadows my goodness i hate words this is a letter sent to the agency half a month ago. The client, Richard Worthington, was one of the shipwreck survivors. Out of interest in the case, we still hope to meet with him even when the client withholds his address. We took steps to locate the client who was living in existence plagued by fear. He locked himself up in a small apartment from far from the apartment far from the outside world and agreed to speak with us after confirming our intentions. And it seems my judgment was not wrong. After carefully answering the questions posed by Lady Truth and me, Mr. Worthington provided us with some valuable information. A confid confidentiality agreement drawn up by Professor Brantley. Oh my goodness. This agreement aims to ensure confidentiality and security over a series of research projects and their results during the scientific expedition. The signatory must keep confidential all meteorological and geological observation reports, descriptions, and collections information related to biological samples and other scientific research achievements related to the Oceanus region during the voyage. The signatory undertakes not to disclose any form of scientific research information or findings within the confidentiality scope of this agreement and shall not privately store or copy samples or informations related to the research project. All parties clearly understand and agree to comply with all provisions of this confidentiality agreement. And this agreement is confirmed by signing this document. Unfortunately, Mr. Worthington was not counted among the research project's core personnel at that time, and the agreement was also very secretive, secretive about the specific research results. It seems Professor Brownlee was trying to hide some of their research discoveries at that time. Apart from the client, the other survivors all went missing or died, and talk of the case gradually fizzled out. Only Professor Brownlee's daughter persisted in bringing up the events of the past. If we can gouge her habits, perhaps we might make some headway in this case. After Professor Brownlee went missing, the young lady became even more elusive, making her existence known only via a few publicly published articles in support of her father. Lady Truth told me she picked up some clues just now. They, might, they may offer us some new insights. These past few days, I've been investigating the port from which the Isambard set sail, and even though the shipping company there has apparently gone bankrupt, I still managed to make some new discoveries. Essentially, a mysterious benefactor has spent has spent a huge amount of money to build another ship, the Isambard, which will depart on March 13th of this year. Another Isambard? I'm, and just take a look at this. Lady Truth pulls a pamphlet out of out from the pile of newspapers in her hands and passes it to me. A flyer with a picture of the is Isambard on the front and a portrait of a gentleman on the back, seemingly recruiting personnel for an event. The rebuilt Isambard will set sail once again on March 13th of this year, retracing the route taken by that faded research team 25 years ago, with a list of crew and passengers as close to the ship's original makeup as possible making for the ultimate restoration. In addition, we have also invited Miss Branley to serve as a chief consultant for this voyage. We will touch the very boundaries once reached by those pioneers, lift the veil on the mist of the unknown, and commemorate those we have lost through our respectful actions and contributions to this timely event. If you ha are interested in becoming part of our scientific expeditions from that year and have fulfilled the qualifications and personnel, personal accomplishments, please contact us through the proposed application system. If you are unaccustomed to life at sea, we will ascertain your health information. We sincerely hope that this landmark voyage will make your dreams come true. 
Look here. We have also invited Miss Branley to serve as the chief consultant for this voyage. Perhaps participating in this event is the only way to get in touch with our target. There is indeed something to this refurbished research ship. And it's not just the com commonplace, fabricated, uninteresting nonsense you might find from other external, uh, external sources. But I haven't been able to pinpoint the exact origin of the young benefactor from this flyer alone. It seems as though this may be his first time making a public appearance. Based on the information received so far, he has channeled a great deal of time and money into perfectly recreating this maritime research project from 25 years past. Just to repeat the scientific study as some sort of sick joke, acting on such a pointless whim would indeed be quite insane. Whatever his motives, he hopes to screen participants who are interested in his plan through these public promotional activities. He's trying to match prospective personnel and their identities with those at the ship's original department time as much as he can. This is a good thing for the investigation. Sorry if you heard my dog. I ended up sitting up because it was actually kind of getting hard for me to read while laying down. Come on. I'm trying to get her to lay back down. Let me think. This voyage should consist of crew members, waiters, and a world-class research team, correct? The opportunity to change one's identity and return along the cursed route of a famous ship sounds like something that might indeed attract people with varying goals. Perhaps on a bright note, fans of the supernatural or writers in search of inspiration might come instead. I believe the benefactor also holds such expectations. Take a look at this sentence. We sincerely hope that this landmark voyage will make your dreams come true. I'm surprised they don't have freaking paranormal detective on this case. Regarding the old case of 25 years ago, the vast majority of clues have already sunk to the ocean's depths along with the wreckage of the ship, while the small portion of the information that returned to shore with the survivors has gradually been lost after each death or disappearance of the related persons. Perhaps this on perhaps only this voyage will lead us to those lost clues. I have a feeling that this may be our only chance to get closer to the truth. Then we better start pre preparing. Our biggest obstacle right now is that neither my previous service record nor my identity as a detective is sufficient for passing the benefactor screening process. Perhaps I need a new identity. Chapter 1. Traces of the Past Falsifying one's identity is the only way to pass the strict review process. The benefactor expects applicants to have backgrounds similar to previous passengers to achieve the ultimate restoration. In order to improve my chances, I'll need to perfect... I I need, I'll need a perfect identity, but such a decision carries certain risks. Subterfuge and success cannot be achieved sim simultaneously. This will be a difficult choice. As Lady Truth organizes a pile of letters, she places an exceptional large envelope on my desk. The postman handed this to me. It's marked urgent and came with a box. Dear Mr. Inference, as you read this letter, you may be facing the challenge of choosing a new identity. Perhaps I can offer you some assistance on this front. Forgive me for not being completely open and honest with you at this juncture. My true identity must remain a secret for now, but I am confident that our interests are aligned in this matter, and the identity I hereby provide to you will greatly increase the probability of your investigation coming to a successful conclusion. Now for your identity, you are a collector who rarely participates in everyday civic life, but is passionate about traveling the world and has a specific interest in marine life. This identity per perfectly matches that of an important passenger on the fated voyage, a partner of the research team. In addition, at least during the voyage beginning this March, you won't have to worry about the victim of this pr proposed identity theft appearing in public. The sudden arrival of this enigmatic Enigmatic, enigmatic, oh my gosh, I think that's right, letter may leave the taste of trepidation on your tongue. 
I did conduct a little private investigation into you and your firm in advance, but considering how quickly our time is running out, please forgive me for forcing such a bold introduction. There's words like I kind of know, like I know them, but because I don't use it or see it a lot, I'm not, I sometimes just don't remember how it's pronounced. If you are willing to accept my proposal, you must also be prepared to adapt to your new role, as your words and actions aboard the ship may end up exposing your true identity. The participants of the restor rest restoration each have different reasons for taking part, and the benefactor is willing to accept this reality. You must be careful. Finally, you will not need to participate in the proposed series of screenings before boarding, as I shall find a solution to bypass this requirement. Please find attached the clothing and props required for your disguise, as well as the necessary identity-related information. Theodore Banks, <laughs> an erudit young collector from a privileged background, 29 years old. Hoo-hoo, hey! <laughs> Theodore Banks attended Greenwood College and showed a strong interest in natural science and specimen co collection during his time here. Mr. Banks devoted a significant portion of his time to his natural science pursuits and was particularly fanatical about marine biology. He was permitted to join a crew through sponsorships at the age of 24 and thus embarked on his first voyage of oceanic discoveries. Theodore Banks' classmates regarded him as an eccentric <laughs> who turned his back on the life of comfort and rarely appeared in public after handing over his land to a third party to manage on his behalf. Mr. Binks has managed to collect thousands of animals and plant specimens, of, new of which nearly 300 are considered new species. The attached, attached self shellfish specimen is the most relevant to this voyage, ma marking Mr. Banks' focus on the impact of marine habits habitats on various species. It seems that someone has taken our plan into their own hands, despite the fact that this mysterious sender has clearly tried to express their kind intentions as sincerely as possible. So will you consider accepting their proposal? He's well aware that it would be difficult to find a more f uh, favorable option than this. Either we lose the opportunity to board the ship or gamble on adopting a com completely unguaranteed proposal. Under the premise that it is extremely difficult to disguise oneself as a researcher, this identity will provide us with a unique advantage in approaching the subjects of this investigation, an important passenger who happens to be on the research as associate. This is indeed the best way for us to approach the case. I believe he has convinced me. Furthermore, according to the information provided by the client, C. rhinoceros, C. Rhino rhinoceros possesses a collection containing numerous treasures. I can confirm that my role aboard the ship should be that of this passenger codenamed C. rhinoceros. Lady Truth nods, accustomed to me making such risky decisions. She opens the box that was delivered with the letter. An expensive-looking outfit, a beautiful collectible, and a pair of, they look like portable telegraphs. This box contains clothing completely different from my usual attire and a snow-white shellfish specimen, which Lady Truth proceeds to place on the office bookshelf. It appears that the collector favors the type of, of outfit you abhor. Fine, I'll tolerate it if it's indispensable for the, disgu for the disguise shell specimen a rare shellfish specimen of considerably considerable academic value this sh should serve as proof of my assumed identity oh. according to the instructions in the letter this shell has a long history it is a pri priceless collectible of a considerable academic value Though few would be interested in purchasing it, the location of its discoveries is close to the area we will be investigating during this voyage. The collector also wrote a de dedicated article proposing some theories on this, on this species, believing that certain habitat, habitats can have a special impact on the species' characteristics. The specimen will serve as compelling evidence of my assumed identity. A pair of portable telegraph machines that seem to be able to communicate with one another across a limited range. Oh, interesting. They seem to have undergone certain specialized modification. Perhaps these are also collectibles of sorts and may serve some purpose during the voyage. In addition to the application form, it's also necessary to organize the collector's articles related to marine 
ecology, ecologic as supporting materials. Whatever the case may be, the identity you're about to assume also possesses a formidable knowledge of biology and taxonomy. You need to you need extensive reading on your part before boarding the ship. I sent the boarding applications to the address provided by the benefactor in the collector's name. A week later, I received a letter of acceptance. The role I intend to play is that of a collector who collaborated with the research team 25 years ago. Oh, here we go. As March arrives, I pack my belongings and step aboard the newly reconstructed Isambard. The sun shines brightly overhead as I make my way up onto the ship's deck. That's the collector. The broadcast fills the air, announcing the regulations of this maritime spectacle. Rule number one, each participant has been assigned an identity corresponding to the passenger list from 25 years ago. Rule number two, the participants' activities will not be strictly restricted, will not be strictly restricted, but it is encouraged that all passengers immense themselves in their assigned roles, fulfilling their respective duties and collaborating to advance various situations and scenarios aboard the ship. Rule number three, while the motivations for embarking on this voyage may vary among participants, we generally hope each individual can fulfill their desires throughout the journey. Oh, look how handsome he is. Mr. Inference. The broadcast comes to an abrupt end and the light of the sun falls upon the empty deck. It seems I am the first passenger to arrive. A selling log containing a record of personnel on duty and a detailed record of the crew's work schedule, from ordinary crew members and helmsmen to catering staff, arranged in great detail. This external hygrometer can gather da data on the sea. The weather is relatively clear at present and humidity is low. Hmm. A trialing nest used for gathering underwater creatures it is an important part of this voyage scientific research equipment and is purportedly identical to the one used 25 years ago. A lifeboat. A lifeboat designed to save as many passengers as possible in case of an emergency. Very nice. The calm sea illuminated by clear sunlight, it is almost free from waves and is as smooth as a velvet carpet. Footsteps approach from behind. When I turn around, two women with diametrically opposed temperaments step onto the deck one at a time. Oh, hello. With a serene and composed demeanor, she exudes... An air of tranquility, subtly hinting at her slight aloofness. The taxidermist carries a tool bag with scissors and for precise work and ke and chemicals to preserve biological samples. The accessory flaunts a design based on the sea lily, an ancient creature that perhaps reflects its owner's interest. It's actually pretty cute, though. Her attire reflects both comfort and attention to detail, complemented by her meticulous white gloves. Noticing the presence of someone else on the deck, the taxidermist keeps a certain distance from me. After observing my attire, it seems she has decided to engage me in conversation. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. I'm the taxidermist of the research team and also the ship's doctor. If I'm not mistaken, you must be... She seems to recognize me. My identity on the ship should be the collector's identity. The pleasure is all mine. I am an associate attached to this voyage scientific research project, a specimen collector. I hope we can collect some truly in invaluable biological samples, and I sincerely look forward to bearing witness to the fruits of your craft as we work together. The taxidermist nods to me, but doesn't offer a particularly positive response. Perhaps she isn't fond of such pleasantries. I've heard of you. I hold no doubts that this voyage to Oceanus will satisfy your exp expectations. The sea at the end of the world, Oceanus. Are you familiar with this stretch of the ocean? Aside from the odd rumors about it, no one really knows that area. 
From a scientific perspective, it's essentially considered an untouched paradise, teeming with potential biological discoveries, a unique habitat indeed. Indeed, what do you know about those rumors? They're just glitched comments from uninspired enthusiasts. Oh my god, interestingly, some of their supporters are joining us on this voyage. She is not trying to hide her attitude towards those rumors at all, but she also seems unwilling to talk about them. Is she the rational sea serpent or the uh, or the trustworthy prister in Professor Branley's notes? No, there are other responsibilities. It's rather difficult to to, deter, to determine at this moment. I notice another lady walking toward us. The taxidermist says goodbye and walks away as if deliberately avoiding the lady. The other lady is exactly the person I've been hoping to investigate, Miss Branley. Oh, you're- oh, that's right. A mysterious dark purple top hat with black hair tied in braids with beads and metal rings at the back of it. She's also carrying some completed nautical charts which depict- an assortment of vessels and exotic creatures according to ancient legends and traditions. Brass compass and ruler essential tools for a variety of drawing tasks. Several unfinished sketches featuring various versions of sailing routes. Based on the findings of our previous investigations, we have a cartographer who is obsessed with mysteries. However, this fascination often results in her nautical charts resembling works of art rather than traditional mats, earning her many loyal fans. <laughs> As a direct relation of the key figure in the case back then, I'm certain a treasure trove of important information must be locked away in that head of hers. According to the rules of this reenactment, she will be playing the role of her own father, the only passenger without a code name. Even though we are strangers meeting for the first time, she stares at me with an expectant smile, with an, un- with an unusual enthusiasm that might make some people feel uncomfortable. Oh, hello, Mr. Collector. I presume it's nice to meet you. I noticed you were observing my work just now. Are you fond of the Legends of the Sea? Indeed I am. I quite enjoy reading about strange tales of navigations, especially thrilling adventures involving sea monsters on the high seas. From a collector's perspective, legends endow many collectible items with artistic qualities and legendary collections are always the product of captivating stories. The cartographer, which I'm probably pronouncing wrong, but it's okay, responds to my words with an exaggerated exaggerated smile. It appears my answers genuinely satisfied her, despite her usual display of overwhelming enthusiasm. Anyway, I'm here to prove that the tales my my father told the world were all true. I love and respect my my father more than anything else. He never told a single lie in his life. Now rest assured you will all bear witness to this simple truth. Just you wait and see, the storm will find us, just like it did 25 years ago, with its pitch black shadows and maddening piercing howls. Unfortunately, not all of us could be able to remain conscious through this adventure. Not a single detail is to be overlooked, we might just find. The cartographer takes a step closer, her her emotions escalating rapidly as if she could compel me to believe her words. I'm left with no choice but to quickly change the subject. I say, have you already met the young taxidermist over there? I suppose you could say that. A bit stubborn if you ask me. Some people just don't appear willing to use even a fraction of their imagination. If they have one at all. Believe me, I've met many such people. But ideas often considered unbelievable unbelievable should not be ejected from the doors of truth before examination, at least. I couldn't agree with you more. Excellent. You're one of the few who are willing to accept my ideas. Truth be told, I really can't say I'm at all fond of doctors, and as for their barbaric instruments, all they do is serve to desecrate the human body. The cartographer appears reluctant to dwell further into the subject. Her attention is fixed on the most recent arrival on on the deck, a person whom I had overlooked boarding the ship. Oh, hello. 
He seems to be a researcher with a retractable mechanical lens attached to one eye, enabling him to meet scientific observation needs with varying degrees of precision. Dressed in garments made of premium fabrics, he radiates the aura of an elegant and privileged young gentleman. He doesn't appear too concerned about getting his clothes dirty, given the chemical splatters, although I can't quite figure out what specific chemical it might be. Carrier's research equipment with him it seems to be some kind of modified portable dead scotch. It seems the benefactor himself will also serve as a member of the research team. From the evidence presented on his person, at least he has some practical knowledge of research work. Greetings, Mr. Collector. I've heard a great deal about you. He wore such an enth enthusiastic expression, fixing his gaze directly upon me, searching the kind of gaze that makes me feel a little nervous. Thank you for participating in my little event. I was pleasantly surprised when reading the articles on marrying life you sent with your application. I assume you have come here hoping to verify the statement in your article about that shellfish. In fact, I'm also intrigued by how the environment can influence orga organisms. The benefactor's tone is friendly, but this doesn't impede my understanding of the true intention behind his words. He's testing me. I do have something that can prove my identity, and that is... Isn't it the shell? It's an honor to know you feel that way. I hope to validate my point of view further, and thank thankfully, the route of this voyage passes through the sea, where a particular species, oh my gosh, makes it, it makes its home. The aristocratic young man before me seems to agree with my statement. I breathe a sacred sigh of relief in my heart and suggest that some food and rest are in order. The codename assigned for the benefactor is also unclear at this point. There is simply too little information available. As I pass through the banquet hall on my way back to the cabin, I notice some unusual marks on the ground. Ooh, some footprints. It's a path of shoe prints covered in suit, stretching from the banquet hall through the corridors to the cabin and halting at the cartographic store in a lingering fashion. From the prints, I can see that the shoes are of very large size, clearly not belonging to the cartographer or any of the individuals I recently encountered. No, my gut feeling tells me there's something peculiar about these shoe prints. Exhausted, I return to my cabin. Despite the fact that it's far from a sanctum of serenity, I need some rest. Old books about natural history collections, they match the identity of the collector who stayed in this room 25 years ago, and the books in the rooms were all published over 25 years ago. A bizarre and meticulously crafted clock shaped like a sea monster. Perhaps the benefactor is also inter interested in the supernatural legends. The standardized luggage issued by the benefactor before the day of departure. Our participants were afford afforded the right to pack a limited number of personal items in this specialized case. An exquisite photo frame showcasing a specific conch image. It appears that the de de decor theme of each room is connected to the passenger at house 25 years ago. Suddenly, a knocking raps at the door. It is a lady holding a camera. Oh, hello. The habit of carrying a camera suggests that she is a journalist who, out of professional habit, is capturing the key moments on the ship. A necklace in the shape of a nautilus. Perhaps she is also interested in marine life? <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Collector. I've heard about you from for some time, so it's really fortunate to meet you in person. The, research are all, the researchers are all busy on the deck. They've asked me to let you know that the research equipment testing has been finished and the project can now officially commence. 
The reporter seems quite interested in the room decoration. With my permission, she takes a photo of the room's various fixtures and furnishing. As far as I can tell in her mind, a wealth of noteworthy details lie in these arrangements. You possess a curiosity and observational aptitude worthy of your profession. I assume you have already met most of the passengers on board. That's very kind of you, I must say. It's mainly out of personal interest that I do not wish to miss a single detail pertaining to the incident 25 years ago. That's very... Oh, I thought I pressed it. And this is your reason for boarding the ship? A journalist should strive to hunt down the most exceptional stories, just like you board the ship to expand your collection. She avoids the question tre trenchantly, perhaps it, as a reminder that she retains a certain level of wariness towards me. My job is to record the progress of the research, but I have also actively made contact with the crew on board. Call it an occupational habit, if you will. From their conversations with each other, it's evident that the crew members must adhere to the schedule outlined in the sailing log. Additionally, it seems that most of them were already acquainted before boarding, except for one notable tall crew member, a newcomer. Just as I am anticipating a continuation of this intriguing divulgence of information, the journalist suddenly stops. She stares at the porthole behind me in bewilderment. Pointing towards the porthole, it seems as though someone is back there. I turn my head. Several seabirds fly past the corner outside the porthole, one after another. Perhaps she was mistaken. Might you have been mistaken? It appears you and I are the only ones in this room. The journalist looks slightly fatigued and shakes her head uncertainly. Uncertainty. I'm not sure. Perhaps I simply need some rest. I'll head back to my room and rest a while. I hope you can now go to the deck with some peace of mind and meet with the others. Based on the journalist's personality traits, her codename and Professor Brinley's account may be, may be one of these. See Unicorn? Sea Unicorn, particularly keen on recording all of the details. Yep, okay. That's right, the Sea Unicorn who is keen on recording details and possesses curiosity it is the most fitting one. I arrive on the deck feeling uneasy. When people are truly st stranded at sea, the seeds of fear are more likely to take root and sprout than imagined. I suddenly remember what Professor Renly wrote in that statement. We had, in fact, left the realm of the living. We needed to remain vigilant about not only the unexplained phenomenon of surrounding us, but also the other unbalanced minds of the people with whom we are selling, per perverted by fear and despair. I don't really have time to deal with the chaotic mass in my head, unfortunately. The weather is still clear and bright, and I can hear the sound of some netting equipment being operated. I walk toward the source of the sound to find several researchers led by the benefactor gathered in a huddle. Here you are. Everything is going smoothly so far. I greet the benefactor. The two academics seem to have just started their work and guide me toward the pile of equipment dripping in seawater. Bro, you got the Clark working. This grayish blue attire evokes an image of thick fog hanging on the sea, carrying a meteorological information to one side and giving off something of a stern impression. A conspicuous pendant, perhaps inspired by a compass. Oh, and you got my boy Alva. This pendant seems to be the tail of some dolphin and a creature that cleverly utilizes sound waves like to communicate in the sea like a wheel a robe almost covers this guest's entire figure the fabric features weave like patterns most likely sound waves they may be related to his research thank you for coming this fine lady and i are in charge of research concerning meteorological phenomenon and sound waves respectively the configurations of these research devices are identical to those who used by the lost research team. At that time, the project was mainly led by two researchers. One of them was the cardiographer's father, Professor Bar Branley. I almost said Barney. He secured the backing of a well-known collector, obtained a considerable amount of funds, and agreed to hold a public exhibit exhibition of the results after the voyage. 
The other head of the team, Professor Schelling, was more focused on the actual progress of the research project. Now reenacting that tragedy, I truly feel such great sorrow for these two talented scholars. The feeling is mutual. Professor Schelling always gave me the impression of being someone who valued the notion of bravery, bearing the torch of knowledge, and passing it on to like-minded souls, wearing that blue jellyfish pendant on every voyage. I've heard it was actually an important family heirloom. Professor Schelling's academic achievements were sadly not directly inherited by anyone. His sole students were all lost in the shipwreck, while his children were too young to learn anything of scientific value from him. This lifeboat should also come in handy for various other things, such as assisting us in our research efforts and allowing us to get closer to the surface of the sea. I sincerely hope that this joint effort will proceed smoothly this time. That this joint. This voyage should be safe enough if we ignore some of the more sensationalist rumors on board. These rumors must undoubtedly be the predictions of this trip espoused by the cartographer. I am not surprised by the hostile attitude conveyed by these scholars. Since this lady is engaged in research on ocean me meteorological, meteorology, oh my gosh, Perhaps she can provide me with her professional opinion on that unsuddenly pr prophetic rant the cartographer performed on the deck just now. Um, since this lady is engaged in research in ocean, provide me with her professional opinion on that unsettling prophetic rant the car performed on the deck just now. This one? Oh my gosh. Oh, the coming storm. Perhaps you may deem such a question to waste of your time, and this is, and if this is the case, I apologize. But the fact is, based on the conditions encountered. By the Isambar, 25 years ago, the rumor has been circulating this vessel that a storm will once again play its part in this tale. The meteorologist turns her attention to the documents in her hands, seeming to lose interest in this topic. Well, of course that won't happen, good sir. As you put it, this nonsense is precisely a rumor and nothing more. The passengers aboard this ship can roughly be divided into two categories, those who are here pursuing rumors and utter chaos, and those who are here in the name of truth and order. I believe the latter group is far more worthy of discussion. A meteorologist and an acoustician, acoustician, their, well, whatever, their codenames and Professor Branley's account must be... First of all, we have the meteorologist, a very stern-looking woman responsible for observing and studying the weather throughout our journey. She should be the sea serpent. Sea serpent never gave up their principles, but unfortunately their scientific predictions were shattered by a storm shortly after. Of course, a professional who can predict the weather and strictly adheres to the principles of rationality. An only possible candidate for the sea serpent is the meteorologist. And another academic who specializes in the field of sound waves, perhaps his codename is among these options. That's Berkeley. No. I think it is Rockets. Love most fleeting and elusive things in life. When the storm came, Rockets insisted on selling. That's right. Those most fleeting and elusive things are sound waves, therefore, Rockets can only be the other. A cost she in. The benefactor carefully han handles the silt and assigns general cl classifications to the organisms. I notice that he deliberately places the jellyfish in a spe specially designed aquarium, skillfully avoiding its tentacles. Perhaps the previous benefactor also had experience dealing with jellyfish. Such in it details cannot be forged. What a beautiful creature, like a specter beneath the waves. I believe you share this sentiment, no? 
Of course, this species does not seem to pose a significant threat to humans. I'm quite fond of the re reproductive glands on the bladder. They almost look like flower petals. You seem to be very interested in this type of organism. You're quite right. This is one of the target species we'll be studying on this trip. Of course, there are also many other species, such as the shellfish you are most interested in. The benefactor points to a patch of flooring not far from us, where many different forms of shellfish have been stacked in a pile, along with various other aquatic species classified in a storage container. Is there any specimen among them you, that you find particularly interesting? Almost all of them are ordinary spe specimens, but after a little cleaning up, they should make for re reasonably good collectibles. That's not a problem. Our facilities on this ship guarantee us optimal mobility. Today, we'll head to the nearby coastline for a thorough investigation. I'm looking forward to it. The dredging devices are ready. Let's prepare for commencement. The myriad elements connected to what really happened 25 years ago gathered once again on this strength stretch of the sea. The participants, each with their own goals in mind, will become my colleagues throughout this research project, but the precise relationship between these passengers and the various codenames ascribed by Professor Brantley remain unclear. In addition to the identities of the passengers yet to be investigated, the scientific achievements lost back then may be rediscovered through our own research. Even though countless clues have long been devoured by the colossal ocean waves or lost to the sands of time, the ocean and its unique ecosystem remain the most faithful witness. Perhaps this renewed research project in an unexplored ocean will provide me with more information pointing to the truth. Ooh. Chapter 2 The Storm Returns as the research project progresses smoothly to the third day, the clear weather suddenly changes. A storm hits the ship in the middle of its salvage operation, which completely contradicts what the meteorologists have predicted. As the weather conditions increase in intensity, the wooden crates on the deck tremble, tumbling from one side of the railings to the other, and the trawling net is almost torn apart by the restless waves. Several researchers fall to the ground, their clothes soaked with cold seawater. After two days of undisturbed salvage work, it is clear that the sudden change in weather pre presents a situation beyond anyone's expectations. Cease all work immediately. No, I can't stop now. See, the storm has arrived, just like my father said it would. Now it's time. The shadows. Horrors. The sound of the storm all but drowns out their voices. I hear the cartographer loudly announced something in the storm and then my shoulder is pulled back and is an extremely tall sailor with his wet hair almost covering his eyes urging me to leave the deck when i got back to the banquet hall i finally had a chance to process everything that had just happened our research on the isambard had to stop because of a sudden storm making the passengers uneasy being so far from land the ship made us feel isolated and helpless but the source of their disconcerting is not purely a product of our situation. As soon as the weather changed, the cardiographer fell into another fevered frenzy, claiming that the storm was just the beginning of that er and that everything would unfold in a way Professor, Professor Branley started stated 25 years ago, with shadows and horrors invading the ship. I can't read. And when the taxidermist and the meteorologist try to speak out against her unreasonable aff affront, someone who seemed to be a sail sailor came upon the deck and asked us to gather in the banquet hall as quickly as possible. The crew are gathered in the banquet hall. It seems they are about to make new arrangements for the sudden storm. A crew member exuding an authoritative air, authoritative Air claims calms the passengers' upended nerves, announcing that the current storm will in no way jeopardize their safety. Ooh, hello. He wears an untrimmed beard and hair that almost covers his eyes, eyes that seem to have difficulty holding the gaze of those he encounters. Overall, he appears to have a somewhat dull personality. He has an ordinary crew uniform and a robust physique, undoubtedly accustomed to long periods of physical labor and shoes stained with black powder. He notices my gaze and nods stiffly to greet me without saying another word. 
Perhaps he is the prister selected to work on the ship based on his extensive experience. No, there are still many other passengers who meet this description. A conclusion cannot be made just yet. Tall in stature, he is dressed in a more senior uniform than the other two crew members, representing a higher level of authority. <laughs> he wears a mask similar to a linear's porthole, one that is impossible to see behind. Oh, he's actually talking to us. I'm the helmsman, and I'm also responsible for management duties. We're used to dealing with storms of this degree. The steward, stewardess in charge of our food, the routine patroller, and the marine engineer responsible for inspecting and managing the engine room are all here. However, the stroker responsible for adding coal to the furnace will not come to the upper deck. If you ever need anything, you can seek out this engineer. He patrols the parts of the ship specified in the log and is very familiar with the ship. The helmsman pats the marine's engineer's shoulder. The latter nods in silence. The number of unde undetermined code names is gradually decreasing. The helmsman should be among them. This long ass name, Burly Physique. Yes, compared to Prister, whatever that word is, who clearly has the authority to give instructions and persistence to defend the ship is more in line with the Hellsman identity. Oh, Demi. Bright, colorful decorations made of red coral adorn the stewardess uniform in some extent, extent reflecting her bold personality. Bringing with her beverages intended for the passengers, it seems that the arrangements of all the food and drink needs on board is her responsibility. Responsibilities is late. I cannot speak. She seems completely unaffected by the nervous atmosphere on the ships and even shakes the wine bottle in her hand at me, as if grateful at this fine delicacy was not fated to become a sacrifice of the recent rattled ship. Recently rattled ship. I am the stewardess responsible for fulfilling the dietary needs of the passengers as well as their expectations of quality with regard to the menu. However, it now looks like I'm responsible for cleaning up the mess in the banquet hall too. She ignores the curious glances around her and kicks away the broken cutlery on the ground with the toe of her shoe. It seems to have been caused by the storm just now. Sudden changes to the schedule are not always a always bad things. In fact, I'm quite looking forward to seeing just what will happen next on this ship. Just now, when the ship was groaning from the turbulence, I suddenly felt as though those, though these manual tasks were not as boring as, and unbearable as they had been the moment before. These two are the helmsman and the marine engineer. That one doesn't say much, but he's good at his job all the same. The stewardess seems to correspond to one of the codenames. Actually, no one is more deserving of this description than her. Siren. Pleasing to the eye and demonstrating a fondness. That's right, the eye-catching figure in this ship's catering staff. Only the siren matches. Noise. The passengers gradually disperse and move toward the corridor leading to the cabin. The answer to a certain question is about to be revealed. The foot... Prints from before leading to the cartography, cartography's room. I'm just gonna start. Just I'm just gonna start saying, Miss Branley. We're unusual, but the conversations has brought new clues to light. Perhaps the key to uncovering the origin of the footprints lies in. Engine room ins inspection. Only the marine engineer who visits the engine room from regular inspections would have had the opportunity to come into contact with Suit. Perhaps it is the reticent marine engineer who hovered at the doorway of the cartographer's room. I don't know exactly what happened. Maybe I should ask the ask Mrs. Ms. Branley for more information. By the time I arrive at Ms. Branley's room, the sea has settled, though murky still. The cartographer opens the door but does not let me in. I'm sorry to disturb you, but I have something to ask, a question that was impossible to broach in the banquet hall. 
The cartographer stares at me for a moment. She doesn't appear to be her usual energetic self, but perhaps because I am one of the few people on the ship who have shown her any kindness, she finally nods in consent. As long as you're not trying to persuade me to give up my ideas, ask away. I was wondering, has the ship's marine engineer ever paid you a visit here in your room? What? I'm not sure what you're implying, but I haven't had any private dealings with that engineer. When I'm not out working, I've been here in my room alone. I haven't had any visitors. And they all hate me anyway. I know that, Claire. They're always, there's always someone staring at me in secret. My father was right. You really do need to keep an eye on the people you're stranded at sea with. Is someone following you? I can't say for sure, but it feels like it. Perhaps it's someone, perhaps it's something. The ghost aboard the ship, like the one my father spoke of. Ha! Huh. But I'd rather be haunted by a ghost than any one of those horrid people we're traveling with. There were so there were so many sooty footprints to, at the door, but according to her, no one came to visit. Perhaps they only loitered here briefly. It seems I'll not be able to form a conclusion with the scant evidence at hand. I'm not interested in the vast majority of people on this ship, and I believe most of them feel the same way about me. My father is the only hero I know of, and all I want to do is prove that he was right. I'm, of course, grateful to the one who holds any interest in me, the benefactor of this event, the one who sought me out despite the ridicule of those people, the one who threw me an olive branch. Even if the others regard me with con contempt, even if boarding this ship had placed me in mortal danger, I still feel that it's all worth it. On the enlistment pamphlet, the benefactor mentioned inviting the cartographer as a consultant. It seems they've enjoyed a smooth partnership so far. I'm glad the two of you came together to make this voyage a reality. I hope you also managed to achieve what it is you're after. He is indeed a reliable partner and he respects me deeply. The benefactor made an outstanding number of preparations before I joined this project and held a lot of information I didn't have, which helped me complete an accurate version of the nautical chart from 25 years ago. Before that, before that, I could not prove the authentic, authenticity of my fa father's experience as I only had half of the chart he left behind, with the other parts in order to be found. The cartographer points to a resort nautical chart on her desk, indicating that this is the result of their collaboration. I believe he, is also, he also has his own reasons for recreating that fated voyage. Even though I'm not sure what it is, my intuition tells me that he and I share some commonality. Commonality. Yes, although he is clearly busy dealing with various affairs, I don't ask much. Except for navigation-related affairs, I can feel the same strong motivation driving his actions. It is always wise to restrain one's curiosity when dealing with others' secrets. Anyway, I really only care about my own problems. The cartographer gestures me to flip through the notes on her desk, which contain many of her experience, experiences traveling to various places to study the legends of the sea. I've compared a large number of folk legends in search of concrete evidence and have drawn the patterns related to these legends on the chart as corresponding parts of the truth. Since the boarding of the ship, the cardi cardiographer has continuously emphasized that her purpose is to prove to the world that her father's alleged supernatural experience was true. Could there be any other meaning behind this? Do you know anything about your father's sudden disappearance after the shipwreck? Even those who made it through the shipwreck were doomed. The curse of that area of the ocean extended to the shore is like algae drenched in a briny scent of seawater. Once it takes hold, no one can break free. In the middle of the conversation, the acoustician acost carries some equipment through the corridor as though about to rush onto the deck. Miss Cardiographer, the storm has subsided. Perhaps we should return to the deck to continue our research. Perhaps the threat she perceives should not be ignored. Is there some kind of device that can provide the cartographer and me with instantaneously communications? I have been recording for almost an hour, for over an hour now. If my thing suddenly stops, it's because I ran out of space. Mm, this thing. The portable telegraph, I can use it to keep in touch with the cartographer. Take this with you. Should you ever find yourself in, in need of assistance, you can contact me through this. I gave my portable telegraph to the carter, whatever that word is. 
and she did not refuse my offer. She then looks at the part hole. The storm is over, but the sky is still cloudy. Thank you very much, but the storm is not done with us yet, and neither is the curse. It is merely affording us to a short respite before the gears of fate continue to rotate onward. You will soon see yourself, but before this is proven to everyone, let's go above deck. Oh, this story is so long. I return to the deck with the other two passengers and the dim embrace of the evening enveloping the ship. Even though the thick fog now extends to the deck, no one is willing to pause the research work for a moment longer. I hear the grinding sound of lifting equipment in the distance, leaving only an abnormal silence once it ceases. Once it ceases. Oh my gosh. My English is just off. The arrangements in the ceiling log seem to have undergone some alter alterations based on the recent weather changes. Due to potentially extreme weather conditions, the portals... The patrols will now have more frequent and for safety reasons, the health men will need to be on duty in the cockpit at all times. The reading on the hygrometer has changed with the weather. Perhaps the dense fog and storm really aren't done with us for now. The benefactor and several other researchers approached to show me the newest trawling results. Even though the light on the deck is weak, I still managed to d distinguish a large number of organisms piled up on the deck, including some unusual specimens. We've gradu we're gradually approaching the target oceanic region, and these creatures are proof this trawl was very successful, perhaps the most successful yet. <laughs> yes, the amount retrieved this time seems to be larger than before. Why is that? Since, they, since approaching the target area, we've noticed a unique biological phenomenon. Plankton is beginning to gather on the water surface at around 6 in the evening, attracting a large number of predators in the process. Seabirds and various types of fish gather together at this location. We've even been able to spot a flock of birds hunting for food from the ship's cabin. After continuously observing this regularly time phenomenon, we seize the opportunity to capture some biological samples. Indeed, these past few days I've also acquired a satisfactory collection of valuable visual materials with my camera. This photograph I took yesterday captures the strange scene of seabirds gathering on the surface. It is a photograph taken from the deck which shows sea seabirds gathering and flying towards the left side of the frame. The taxidermist seems to be captivated by this phenomenon of biological aggregations on the ocean surface. As you can see, even though we're only on the edge of Oceanus, the impact of this environment on biological organisms is breathtaking. The benefactor puts on his gloves once again and places a squid in a transparent water tank. It is clear to see that this is a bobtail squid. As the pigment cells on its epidermis rapidly contract, I notice that its number of tentacles is undoubtedly abnormal. And those jellyfish, it's a real shame as far as our research is concerned for they will soon become one with the sea again. Many jellyfish, jellyfish on the ground have begun to dissolve or have lost their vitality after being caught. A very small portion of the hull emits a weak blue and purple bio, bioluminescence, which is out of place among normal samples. There are also some unique black stones that exhibit this very porous structure and many holes just distributed on their surfaces, which were most likely formed by submarine and volcanic eruptions. I attempt to pick up the special black stone, but am stunned on the arm by the tentacle of a jellyfish. The pain is like a piercing needle. I immediately feel dizzy, and the scene before my eyes begins to become slightly distorted. Fortunately, its sting is not very severe. One must take caution when dealing with the creatures here. The algae and plankton in this area seem to carry very weak toxins, but certain organisms have amplified their tox toxicity through ingestion, such as the jellyfish. Generally speaking, both ingestions through the esophagus and penetration, penetration through the epidermis can have an impact on the human body. Among the research team, only the Carter shows a lack of interest in these mutated creatures. She makes her way past the lifeless biological samples, climbs onto the railing, and gazes into the depths of the ocean mist. Miss Cartographer? 
The fog will draw in those shadows. I can feel their eyes on us. Now that we have finally arrived here, the gates are about to open and there's no escape. Beneath the waves aboard the ship. Ha ha. Ha 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 ha. How ridiculous. I grab a lamp and look at the ocean below. The mist blocks my view. The faint light of the lamp too weak to illuminate anything in this dimly lit area, except for the throbbing of the rushing waves. I have confirmed it on the instruments. Another huge storm is here. Yet again, this one is certain to shake the ship more severely than last time. It will be in our all best interest to return to the banquet hall and notify everyone to secure all loose items in the place in place. Indeed, this change of weather is different from before. We need to be prepared. This hull of organisms could prove to be exceeding value exceedingly valuable. We should strive to finish our classification organization work before leaving the deck. As the ship pushed and pulled by the risen storm, the benefactor falls flat on the deck. He tries to lean against the railing to support, to support himself, but with some difficulty. The benefactor ra- rises with the assistance of the other researchers. Typically, re- research work does not involve such physical strain, leading me to believe that his ailment is not simply fatigue from research or ordinary seasickness. Perhaps you should rest. Do you need me to carry out any ex- examinations for you? I'm just tired, that's all. If I deem it necessary, I'll seek medical assistance from you. (laughs) Theoretically speaking, it's unlikely that you're merely suffering from fatigue. Scientific research doesn't place this heavy a burden on the body. You can leave the classification work to the rest of us. Thank you kindly, but we need to hurry up. The sea is growing more extreme and volatile the closer we get to oceanus and this thick fog and stormy weather is becoming more frequent sorry if you can hear my dog she's licking her paw stop it the ship from 25 years ago faced similar challenges with passengers being engulfed by the ocean in chaos and fear after colliding with the rocks these disruptions also led to the spread of certain rumors regardless This is a threat that we need to be cautious of. Come on, Gemma. It seems the benefactor is not found of these supernatural legends. That somber selling ascends from below, carrying a toolbox to repair the mechanical equipment on the deck. After a few simple after alterations the pointers of the instruments begin to move again he waves in the thick fog urging us to leave what needed repairing we just passed through an abnormal magnetic field so some of the instruments malfunctioned and needed to be sorted out it appears the research work has come to a halt let's leave for now even if we're not on deck there are still other matters of import import that we could be attending to the recent trawling results are evidence that we're progressively approaching our destination. If you're interested in the unique habitat of Oceanus, I'd be more than willing to provide you with further details. You don't seem to be in the best shape. Are you sure you're all right? There's no need to worry. I'll go to the cabin and rest for a while. The details I mentioned are also in my room. Perhaps you'd like to come along with me, Mr. Collector? The benefactor invites me to his cabin to talk. I accept willingly. The truth is I have been curious about him for some time now. Oh my god, how long is this? I don't know how long my phone's going to let me record. The book's presence in the benefactor's room are slightly different from those in mine. Most of them are complex tomes related to scientific research, and upon closer observation, some were published within the last 25 years. The items in the benefactor's room confirm to the identity of the researcher 25 years in the past. But things such as this beautiful jellyfish are also in line with the benefactor's personal interests. Oh my gosh, I'm trying to read fast. As you can see, this room has also been decorated according to the identity of its occupier 25 years ago and is slightly different from your room. 
However, some of the books in my room have been replaced with more recent academic materials to better serve our research work and, of course, out of my interest. Is there any information in particular, particular that you'd like to share with me? There is. Perhaps it will help you better understand some of the discoveries we've made during our trawling operations these past few days. The benefactor takes a book from the shelf. The cover of this book is printed with images related to underwater volcanoes. This book discusses the impacts of special habitats and biological evolution. Submarine volcanoes are one of these habitats. The area in which we are currently located is also home to this kind of landform. This book cites, cites some of the Professor Skelling's viewpoint in support of its pr premise. Promise. Oh my gosh, I can't read. If Professor Brenly had not gone missing, he might have publicly criticized such a hypothesis. His interpretations of the main argument was the complete opposite. Unfortunately, this doesn't explain the predominant reason behind the mutations prevalent in oceanic species, such as the migration of plankton from the seabed to the sea surfaces, surface at around 1800 each day over the past few days. This species is not known to conduct this manner of, of timed migration, so needless to say, were all quite flabbergasted. Perhaps there are many other reasons for this phenomenon that may lend you this book. I hope it inspires you some insights into your own interest. So 6 p.m. each day. As I'm about to put away the book lent to me by the benefactor, the ship begins to shake violently and the wooden boards and nails in the cabin rattle with sharp moans. And in my, in my panic, I look out of the porthole and sure enough, the ship is in the throes of a violent storm once again, no different from the legend of 25 years ago. I struggle to advance through the ship, but as I pass the banquet hall, I discover that the door leading to the deck has not been properly closed, and a woman's shoe is stern upon the stairs. It belongs to the photojournalist. Without paying heed to anything else, I ran toward the deck. After searching for a short while in the grip of a raging elements and the swaying of the ship, I finally come upon the photojournalist in a corner. She looks bewildered and seems unaware of the fact that she's in great danger. But why? What are you doing here? Oh. Don't you realize the danger you're in? Chema, I couldn't possibly be in any danger. Don't worry. You need to go back to your room. Did the crew not tell you to depart from the deck? I was following the guidance. Something is calling me under the sea. Those gentle whispers don't stop crawling through my ears. Oh my goodness, my hair. Sorry, I was like hitting my hair. It isn't her words themselves that startle me, but the transformation that has taken a hold of her. The photojournalist always struck me as someone with a mind governed by rationality, but the power of the curse seems to have consumed her being, changing her into someone completely unfamiliar. I carefully observe the photojournalist's demeanor and, con and confirm that she is not attempting to deceive me or play some treacherous joke. Treacherous joke. Oh my god, my English. She seems unable to respond to my questions at a normal speed, and her gaze seems to be constantly flickering from mine. She keeps gazing at some unspec unspecified space behind me. What are you looking at? I turn around amid the raging wind and rain. The deck is still empty with only the pitch black mass standing tall in the mist. Suddenly, I remember the possible hallucination experienced by the photojournalist in the cabin. Maybe this isn't just a coincidence. She saw birds flying past as a mysterious black shadow, and now it's this mass. Perhaps this was some strange distortion of the sense based on reality. Either way, the se severity of her abnormal abnormality has escalated. I should take her somewhere safe immediately. I hope this is going to end soon. After escorting the photojournalist back to her room, I once again advised her not to venture off alone during the storm. 
it isn't until I actually sit myself down on the sofa in my room that I realize just how exhausted I am. My drenched clothes and frayed nerves have left me feeling extremely ill at ease. The night is unusually uproarious and the ship's cabin cannot ins insulate us from the thundering storm and the continuous shaking makes it particularly difficult for me to fall asleep. I seem to be suffering from something even worse than pure exhaustion. Specific sounds emitted by the sea drill constantly into my ears and I even begin to doubt whether these sounds are real or products of my imagination. In the darkness, I overcome by my wave of vertical. The next day, this dizziness and fatigue persists. As does the storm, I arrive at the banquet hall and find that the few people gathered there seem to be gradually losing themselves to the anomalies aboard the ship. Oh my gosh. There's still more. I don't know if I should keep going. I guess we'll try. Most of the passengers are experiencing consider considerable, f considerable fear and distress due to the resurgence of the storm and the rumor attached to it. However, the taxidermist exhibits a relaxed and joyful demeanor that is completely out of place. The cardiograph looks even more anxious than she did a few days ago, continuously walking back and forth in the banquet halls, though completely immersed in her own world. However, her physical fr frality cannot be masked by her activity. Upon careful observation of her face, it is evident that she has not slept in several days. The benefactor seems as worn out as before. Something is constantly consuming his energy. Fortunately, his faculties are still intact. This is similar to the anomaly pre previously exhibited by the photojournalist. Could it be, you must all believe me, believe now that something will definitely descend on this ship, no? Just look at everything happening around you. You all know it has to be true. You're simply refusing to acknowledge reality. You don't have the courage to face your fear, and that's why you don't even dare to speak your minds. Absurdity has always been a part of reality. Soon, soon you'll be engulfed in this ab abominable sea merging with it and becoming its next source of nourishment. The cardiographer's voice almost quiver when the excited vibrato as she gestures exaggeratedly with her arms to the passengers. A low rumbling sound comes from outside the window, the sound of giant waves and lightning colliding. The benefactor seems to be indifferent to the cartographer's performance and the taxidermist who often speaks out in refutal, refute, Refutation, I don't know why I said refuddle. <laughs> Refutation as such elsewhere is now silent and no longer responsive. Anyway, compared to these concerns, ensuring the safety of Mr. Branley and the other researchers is the most pressing matter at hand. Ha ha, ha ha, you're right, too true, very good. I didn't expect you to be the first one to return to the fold. What? The cardiographer lets out a series of, of elated giggles. The words of the mirologist fill me with unease. There is no Mr. Brainley on this ship. She seems to have confused the voyage of 25 years ago with our present situation. This one at drama is ultimately interrupted by a storm of a greater magnitude to the, as the ship tilts to an upper-seated angle under the force of the waves and some of the ship's furnishing are thrown to the ground like toys. Then the stewardess appears, propping herself up by the entrance outside the corridor. It seems some new emergency plans are about to be announced. Would all passengers please, please return to the cabin at once until the storm subsides? Everyone must stay inside their rooms. Food and water will be delivered to your rooms by the crew, and during this period, no passengers are allowed to go outside without permission. So is this new order effectively one of, one of confinement? I have faith in the professional judgment of the crew, and I do not wish to take any risk with the safety of anyone on board. So yes, I believe we should all stay in our rooms for the time being. The passengers follow the crew's advice and disperse, one after another, returning to their own cabins, and I am no exception. Being isolated in the cabin alone must feel almost feels like torture, and there is practically nothing to entertain me in my room other than books. The cabin constantly jolts, jolts under the force of the waves, and it is not difficult to imagine the terrifying wind tearing at the stays of it with its savage war. After eating the dinner brought to me by the stewardess, the dizziness in my head still remains. It seems as though I can see a pitch black reef outside the window. My thoughts turn to rest, but the sound of the huge storm almost fills my head completely. When I awaken, I find that the portable telegraph by my bedside has received a message from the cartographer. There is only one dot on, 
on the blank piece of paper and then nothing. It is impossible to form a complete picture in my mind with this information alone. I previously instructed the cardiographer to only communicate with me via the telegraph machine should be should an emergency emergency arise. Did she accidentally operate her device or I glance at the clock in my room, it seems to have stopped working, frozen in time, its hands motionless at six thirty. A faintly ominous sensation overtakes me as I open the door and ran towards the hallway outside my cabin. It seems the others have already gathered at the entrance of the car cartographer's room. The cartographer, something terrible has happened to the cartographer in her room. You came just in time. The culprit was right here. We all saw it. Chapter 2 has ended. Chapter 3 will be available on April 11th. Oh my gosh. I'm so surprised my phone recorded for this long. Anyways, I'm going to try and hurry up because I don't know how much longer my phone's going to be able to record. I'm very sorry for a lot of my mispronunciations for certain words um i'm like i said it's really late really tired and i had to do it this late because like i said i messed up and then i told xena that i would try to get this recorded and finished be just in case um someone from asia server won in her giveaway and she just pulled the winners and i don't remember if she said one of them was was or not but I had to try to finish this at least. But that is very, very interesting. Oopsies. And we have to wait until April 11th for to see what happened to Violetta. I'm assuming someone killed her. She's probably dead. But that is a lot. That is a lot. This was really long. Literally almost an hour and 30 minutes right now. Probably a little shorter because I did take a little while to start the beginning, but still. That's crazy. Look at that. Oh, look at that. There's like four unknown ones. Look at that. I There's so many words that I saw there that I don't ever really see a lot of. So, like, I never really had to, like, pronounce it. Just like this one cartographer cartographer i'm gonna have to look it up you guys will probably tell me in the comments if i said it wrong or not i probably did but i'm very excited to see what happens um hopefully i won't record this late again anyways let me know what your thoughts are if you have uh if you've done this and actually read it and stuff I'm very interested to see what's going to happen next, and I can't wait until next week. Anyways, hope you guys all have a good night. Thank you for taking the time and listening to me read the story and reading badly because of how late it is. And sorry that you could hear my dog once in a great while. Anyways, see you next time. Bye!